Hello and welcome back once again to the Game Pit Podcast. We are continuing our countdown to Essen Ronan with another Treasure Hunt episode. Treasure Hunt Part 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. <laughs> You went all techno, I like okay. it. <laughs> we can do this on the robot voices. Let's not, eh? Okay, that's not, that's definitely not. That sounds bad enough without doing that. <laughs> Have you fixed your microphone yet? No, and? Didn't, just check in, that's Amazon Prime's a thing, that's all. Okay, so we're uh, part two of our Treasure Hunt for 2019. This is where we take a look at 12 upcoming games. Well, sort of upcoming, Sean. We both of us have made a bit of a... Uh, 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 yeah, there a couple of boo-boos in there that we started doing our research and there's actual full reviews of the games, but never mind. <laughs> it sounds like they're available retail for the first time this Essen, but yeah. some of these games may have come out as Kickstarter previously. Is that kind of is that the line we're going on? Well, let's let's play Merrick Martin. They're on his list for Essen 2019. <laughs> <laughs> the pit whip is, these are all Essen releases. Okay, so we haven't played any of these games, as your usual reminder. So therefore, we're looking at rule books, we're watching videos, we're just judging for us whether we think that they're going to make it back in our bags as a treasure, or they're a trap to snap off the fingers and steal the euro off the unwary. Absolutely, Ronan, so please don't get upset if we, we call things that you love or grow to love a trap, because we haven't played them. That's so basically a guess. Shot in the dark. <laughs> so, we're going to kick off with the first of our 12 games for a preview, and the first one is called Myths Gate. It's a 2-6 to six player game, taking 60-90 to 90 minutes, designed by Maria Perez Alvarez, which is her first design, and coming from a GDM who did the Sherlock Enigma games, Demon Worker, Shikoku. This is a fantasy-themed one-versus-many game, in which the one is controlling dark forces and they are an invader into this kingdom, and through these gates they're going to be moving minions along tracks in order to get to the centre and to the castle area, using gems to power up their actions. The others are all working to stop those minions from advancing along. And if they work together to stop the the, uh, the invaders, that's how they're going to win. And it's all driven by card-driven dri- combat. Now, Sean, <laughs> there's really literally nothing on Board Game Geek about this, apart from someone pulled some artwork a couple of years ago off the GDM website. We happen to have a bit of a relationship with GDM and PAC, and we said, oh, we're interested in covering some of your games, and he sent us through a couple of rule books. This was one of them, and we've both read that rule book, so therefore, we definitely know how to play. Let's clarify. I think it was a uh, pre-production rule book. I don't know if it was actually finished, but I ho- well, let's say I hope it is yet to be finished, Ronan, because... I was very worried about coming back to you saying, Ronan, I've done it again. I, I didn't get anything from that rule book at all. Can you explain it to me? And you said... No, no. <laughs> I, I can't explain it. No. no. I, just, <laughs> I could probably set the game up. I couldn't tell you how a round works. Yeah, it was a little bit hard to decipher. So we got the one against many. It starts off on a bad foot for me. Ronan, because I knew you were going to say it. I you know, hate one I versus don't, many I just games. I don't like the one against many. Well, why don't you like one versus many? If I'm playing a co-op, I want everyone to be involved in the co-op. I don't want letters from my chapel. True, true. Okay, there are exceptions that prove the rule, but oh, they prove the rule, do they now? <laughs> <laughs> just to see you how these exceptions work. I know, I get it. Not the rules wrong, but every exception actually goes to strengthen it. I know, I understand now. <laughs> This is like having an argument with my mother. No matter how it goes, your mother is never wrong, Ronan. <laughs> okay, Ron. All right, I'm sorry I said anything. Anyway, there's a reason why we're not talking about Mythgate and we're babbling. Because we don't know. So what I did glean, Ronan, so uh, battles and general play seem from afar to might, they might be luck of the draw to a certain degree. I don't know, mate. Honestly, <laughs> I'm not even joking. I'm not trying to be funny. I don't know how they work. I know it's card-driven. And I know that the, the invader uses gems to power up some of his actions. But I just couldn't grok it. And again, right, we're in Essen, reading loads of rule books, doing videos, getting prepared for these, all the rest of it. I genuinely, there's only so much effort I can put. And if I've read your rule book three times and I can't tell what the round structure is, you're done for me. <laughs> no, absolutely, yeah, fair enough. When there are a couple of things, iconography I thought seems good if I knew what the iconography actually was. It was clear. 
So you're and, guessing the iconography. Yeah, well, guess guess the iconography. There was one slight thing I had an issue with on top of the rule book and not been understanding it. The powers just didn't seem that interesting. They seemed very sort of mundane, blah, like I've seen it a hundred times before, all the powers that you use when, when defending. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a trap because we can't really grok it at all. But uh, I think possibly one to try out. <sighs> Obviously a trap. Now, the reason I, I put it on here is from the idea and the fact that GDM do slightly different games. The games that, that we've played with before are not just bog standard following the same old routine. So I was hoping for something, some sort of an angle. I'm still hoping for that angle. But on what we have, given also for, you know, we got sent the rule book. If you were looking at this going into Essen with nothing, or literally nothing on the BG page, how can it be anything other than a trap? GDM, you, you got to put your finger out on this one. This is not this is not looking good. I can't see this getting massive sales in Essen. Hopefully we'll revisit it after we've played it and maybe we'll have some more positive news for Mythgate, but a trap for now. Okay, so moving on to a game where I think we both grokked fairly quickly. It's Bloomtown, designed by Asker Harding Granud and Daniel Skjold Pedersen from Sidekick Games playing two to four players. This is a city-building tile placement game. Players are each going to have a personal board that's a 5x5 five five grid, and each space has a flower type depicted on it. You're going to have a central community board, which is going to have piles of building tiles, and each one of the piles is related to one of the five flower types on your personal boards. The building tiles are offices, subways, parks, homes, and shops. Also in the piles are rescoring tiles. And once you get to two of these, you're going to rescore everything. But let's go on with the game. So players are going to start with two random buildings. And on a turn, you're going to build, place a tile on your player board. And whatever flower you cover denotes what tile stack you're going to take your next building from. So you've got to score points in many different ways for each building, whether they're diagonal, orthogonal, different types of building adjacent, etc. If two of those rescore tiles come out, as I said, you're going to score in a slightly different way for each of those buildings. And that's pretty much it, Ronan. Very, very simple city building game. Yeah, and you have to love how clean the look is, how the simplicity of it, the shortness of the rules, this is definitely one which is a pick up, quick teach and play, Sean, and definitely the market that they have aimed for. Yeah, they've gone for that small package, small time frame market, and I think it probably hits both of those square on. I agree with you, Ronan. I think the game looks really nice, really clean, maybe a little bit on the clinical side, but I think the flower part of the game probably takes it away from that and i like that the building tiles are all different so you do kind of feel well possibly feel that you have something different to the other players even though it in essence is probably not one concern about that is when you play shops they score for two different colors and it does seem like that bit of the graphics is not very clear and there's very small banners on top of the shops that show which colors this scores for so that'd be my one concern but that is just a nitpick on the look of the game so it's random to some degree, Ronan, in that the tile that comes out is is off the top of a stack, but you get to see that tile yourself. So therefore, there are, is some control over what you do. And obviously, you're going to place over a certain type of flower, which gives you more control because you're taking from that stack. So the, while there is random in it, I think there is a lot of control. And that's the full decision process. It is, is a very simple game. The decision process comes from how you set yourself up for the next move. The question for our listeners is, and for me, is in this well-presented, simple game that looks really nice, is that decision space big enough in order for us to want to bring it back home from S and Sean? Is there anything in there that you can see that, that adds on or gives it a twist more than that, other than... I know which tile I'm taking by covering over a particular flower. And due to the scoring, which actually I think is quite generic scoring, it's, you know, what's in the same row, what's in the same column, what's diagonal. I can't see any twist in that. Is there any twist in there you can see that goes, oh, oh, that's a bit, mm. The bit that I think might be slightly different and is, is the planning ahead because you're going to run out of flower types and it's planning not to sort of completely box yourself in by by using up all those flower types and giving yourself options throughout the game 
And I think you're going to fill up that board quite quickly. And if you haven't given yourself options, then I think you might come unstuck. That's maybe the bit that is going to just push it beyond the, the mediocre for me. Oh, now I'm really teetering on a fence for Bloomtown <laughs> because for what it's doing, I think it looks quality. I think it looks a really nice production. It's only 20 euro at the fair. Incredible price point for this game. For the production, is there enough there for me? I'm completely on a fence, Sean. I think overall, generally, it's a treasure, a personal... Go on then, because of the price point, it's only €20, Euro, and I think there's fun in the box, and I think they, they have done a good job. Even if I'm not the target audience, I'm going to go treasure. For me, running it, it's portable, it's quick playing, and it's a gateway city builder. I I have some sort of belief in the design, well, one of the designers at least, and it's going to be a treasure for me. I will probably try to pick this one up in this Beautiful. That saves me from having to do it. I didn't have to teeter. I didn't have to agonise over that one. <laughs> Okay. Our next game is Tres Majestus. This is a one to four player, around two hour long game. It's a first design by Federico Pierre Lorenzi and Daniele Tuscini is also had a hand in it. That's a big name in design. Design Zolkin, Voyagers Marco Polo, Tio Tuacan and many others. The publisher is Board and Dice, who also did Tio Tuacan, Dice Settlers, Escape Tales and many other games. In Truism Majestus, each of the players is an alchemist and we're all trying to unlock the Philosopher's Stone following the uh, the guidance or the teachings of Hermes Truism Majestus, who apparently was a famous alchemist, but I didn't know that. There you go. The main mechanism of the game is, is that dice are going to get rolled and they're going to get put into bowls around the board. And then on a player's turn, if they've already got a die in play, then they'll use that die to power their actions. Or if they haven't, they're going to draft one of these dice and then use the potency for actions. And you're going to draft three over the course of a round, and there's three rounds in the game. Now, the potency of a die when you draft it is equal to how many dice are in that bowl when you take it. Everything else, the bottom number of dice, then links to what you can do with that die on your turn. Now, each of the different faces has got a different symbol. They are linked to materials such as silver and copper and mercury and whatever. And you can use potency on the dice and move it down a little track because it comes to me with four potency because there was four dice in there. I move it down two spaces. I can take two off whatever material is shown on the face up of that die. The bowl that I took it from, that is linked to essences, which I need to do certain things over the course of the game. So therefore, I can take away potency in order to collect certain essences. The colour of the die, that is linked to transmutation paths. Now, when I take materials, they go into particular areas on my lab on my own board. And these areas are linked by paths, by, and the colour of your die tells you what you can change one material from to. Now materials are all these yellow cubes, it's just where they are on the board then denotes what they are and therefore by using your die to do this transmutation you can change what material this yellow cube stands for. As you're doing that and pushing along the transmutation paths you can activate artifacts along the path that, which have got various different powers but also you can use the potency on your die in order to recharge artifacts if you think you're going to transmutate along the same path again. Also using the symbol on the die, you're also going to be able to gain experiments. Now, experiments are ways in which you're going to score points in the game, and they're going to ask for particular combinations of materials that you've acquired and transmutated to on your board. And in handing those in, you can perform an experiment, and that is going to be part of your VP scoring at the end. Now, while you're making these choices for your own die, each of your opponents is going to have reaction tokens. And they are then going to be able to follow what you've done. So, for example, if I've got a particular symbol on my die and that only gives me access to copper, but I need silver, and Sean has drafted a silver symbol die, when he takes silver, I can use my reaction token in order to also take silver. And in that way, you're aware of what everyone else is doing and you're not just stuck on your one die at the time. Now, I talked about that transmutation. There are element mastery tracks for earth fire air and water and every time you transmutate you can go up mastery tracks and they allow you to activate certain things as you go up and you require certain levels of mastery to take particular actions and do experiments and what have you in the game now these materials that as you transmutate them they become refined ones that's how you're going to do experiments and when i said whenever you do experiments you get to take vp you're also going to get bonuses 
but according to whatever experiment it is that you've got in your hand, which again will boost things that you're doing. And also it's gonna help you unlock a formula. Now each player's got their own eight tile formula, which is gonna come in four columns of two tiles. And the first time you do a particular experiment of a particular type, you can put uh, one of your formula tiles into play. You can then spend gold to put other ones into play. And the more of your formula that you've put into play, the more points you're gonna score at the end of the game. And also every time, that you have them in play, you can flip them over for a one of power. Again, looking to, to trigger and use bonuses and link together with artifacts in order the one simple action becomes something that triggers onwards and upwards. As I said, the game is played over three rounds. When everyone's finished doing all their actions over the end of the third round, we're gonna score our VP for experiments that we've done, for formulas that we have collected, for mastery on those tiles. And also the last thing is there are publications in the game, which are more or less objective cards. And you can that's how you're gonna collect stuff like that from artifacts, bonuses, and what have you. And your personal objective cards, if you've been able to, to do those publications and do what you said you're gonna do, that's also gonna score you some VP. Sean, a combo-tastic Euro game, which at the heart of it is you're just drafting nine dice over the course of two hours, but it's very much what you do with those dice and how you use the simple actions to trigger off all the other possibilities that's going to dictate whether you're playing this well or not. Just drafting, drafting those three dice per round makes it sound that there's not too much happening there, but... My word, there's a lot happening beyond that, Ronan. <laughs> the way you draft the dice, from what pool you draft the dice, the colour, the symbol on the dice, all has a different connotation as to what you're about to do. And a lot of actions can stem from the draft of those three dice. So my question to you, Ronan, is there almost is there too much going on? I really struggled to grok this one, even though I didn't think the rule book was that bad. It was just so much happening and so many icons. They've got a whole back page on the rule book just full of icons. It's like, whoa. Yeah, I can't claim to have a full grasp on this, obviously. <laughs> what I'm saying there that you do experiment and you get a bonus and you do an artifact, you get a bonus and you flip over a formula and you get a bonus. That's the sort of thing that it's not possible to grok from a rule book that you just have to have the components in front of you. This is one of those games that I would have to get out on the table and run through a three-player game all by myself just to get how it all works, to then be able to teach people to give them an idea of the flow. Because like you say, on the face of it, just drafted nine dice, that's not enough. But it's how they all combo together. I agree with you, I do like the rule book. I think it makes it simple. What I'd love for there to have been is possibly a glossary of the cards and the experiments so that you can actually look them all up and say whenever anyone's got a question especially new players if it's all symbology it's very hard for them to go well, what, what is it I, i'm so much easier to have a second booklet that says here you go that's what every card does look up your card and then we can all get on with playing the game and they're not worried about revealing too much to the teacher and the teacher's not worried about having to run the game all the time there is a lot going on there. I think they suggest that it's a two-hour time frame about that. I, I have concerns that this may go on even longer than that because there are so many connotations. I think AP-induced players, or even people not normally prone to AP, are going to find this one really hard to decipher what they're going to do next. I agree with you. That, yeah, because every single action has got connotations further on. That's obviously going to be the hook for, for medium to heavyweight players because they're going to be like, great, every single move I do, I can, and their brains will be firing off. I, I think once you've learned the game and you've got into the flow of it, I can definitely understand your concerns about AP because even from the draft, to consider five things at once and to think, if I take that, that's going to affect all of my next however many actions, which then affect all the subsequent actions, which then affect what experiments I can do, it is going to be a massive brain burner. I fully understand. Sean, I do like the fact that in this sort of weight of a euro, it's not too solo, and those reaction tokens mean that it's not just people pooting around their own lab doing an action you don't really care what they're doing. You are going to be watching and trying to anticipate, for example, if you've got that silver symbol die and I need the silver, I'm going to have to try and anticipate when you're actually going to take because you might never use it to take silver. 
and I'm waiting for you to do a particular action and that could be both part of interaction and possibly part of frustration in such a, a game where each link of the chain is important. That's fine, you just steal my last point. It was me. Oh, hot- well, don't worry, I just did it. It was me right. save, saving it. Our reaction tokens are going to add interest on other turns. Brilliant. Thanks for thinking that way. Do you just agree with me then? I'll just carry on talking. <laughs> if you're saying everything I say is right, okay. Okay. I can't believe you haven't mentioned it, so I'll come into it. To me, I don't love the look of the game, and it looks like an NSKN game. Now, Board and Dice bought NSKN last year or whatever, which has been a positive move from our point of view. The look retains some of the sort of messy, unfinished look that NSKN games have sometimes, which makes them harder to play. Have I mentioned to you that I don't like you very much? Okay. Was that another point you made? <laughs> <laughs> that was part of my summary. <laughs> both, ah. both of those points. <laughs> the look of the game and I thought that it did feel more like an NSKN product than Board and Dice. We need to stop sharing the hive mind sometimes. Just like shut it off when we're preparing for church. <laughs> Shall I just sum up? Unless you've I think it's points. probably time, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I don't like the look of the game. Really abstract feel to it. It doesn't bring me into the game. It does feel like an NSKM product or project. Hold on, hold on. With a decent rule book, though. With a decent rule book. And what I would say is this is probably the the benefit of the the merger between nskn and board and dice all of a sudden you've got games that possibly could have just strayed from the mark might be hitting the mark now for me personally i think if there's too much going on with that abstract feel married together i think too difficult for me to grok I'm I'm out on this one. I'm more than happy to give it a go should Ronan decide he's going to bring it home. Sean, I am bringing it home and you're 100% wrong and this is a 100% treasure. I am so intrigued by that idea of that. I actually feel my brain firing up and stoking its fires, getting ready to be in agony. It's that thing, you know, when we sit sometimes with a Euro, especially I remember doing it with Steve Paget, and the three of us sit there just staring at the board for five minutes, not saying anything, and suddenly we look up and we realise we've all got furrowed brows and we just start laughing because we're all like, what, what are we just sitting there doing? We're just thinking, overly thinking. Is it Spock brain, he calls it, when Kirk goes into Spock's brain and he can't cope with all the things that are going on. I'm looking forward to Spock's brain with Tris Majestus and it's a definite treasure. I'm in because it's simple actions which then drive a lot of possibilities and a lot of choices, as opposed to other Euros we may discuss at some point in this episode. So Trismegistus, 100% treasure. I'm sure one of those is literally about to come up. I just want to say one thing, but am I enjoying that game of Trismegistus? Sometimes you get that furrow browse, but you know where you're going with it because the theme is telling you, right, you're going to do this and you're going to do this. I actually thought this, this felt quite thematic, more thematic than other games about alchemy, but the fact that you're taking in something and then you're having to use particular elements to change it into, obviously, uh, <laughs> alchemy's not true, but, but in the idea of it, and following past, and the fact that your lab is set up in a certain scientific way, if you like, and put that in quotes, that I need this, and I need that element, and I need this in order to change it into that, which I then do something with and run my experiment. The fact that it's a clear formulaic process, that felt like chemistry or alchemy to me. Okay, fair enough. Fair I have got an E in chemistry A level, so I'm, I'm quite the expert on <laughs> well, that. Practically a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're moving on to Cooper Island. Now, I promised myself I wouldn't give myself any big, sprawling Euro games with lots going on, and I've lied, haven't I, Ray? So You're on a timer for this rules explanation. Oh, my God. And for the love of Jesus, don't give us a components list because we'll be here all week. There is an un- I, uh, true. I, there is an unholy amount going on in this game. Fingertip <laughs> grasp on these rules, sure. Let's just brush across the top, please. <laughs> you have to explain it to a certain degree what's on the table, otherwise no one will know what they're doing. But anyway, <laughs> Cooper Island, designed by Andreas Odendahl, Capstone Games and, uh, and others. We are explorers colonising a new home, and we are removing barriers, placing statues and buildings while preparing for supply ships to visit us. On the table, you have a central action board, and this central action board has one island per player shooting out from it. 
The player boards are going to have workers. They're going to have statues and buildings to put onto the board and income and supply ships. The game is going to be played over five rounds. Each round has three phases. You start off with the income phase, which isn't as simple as in most games, because in the income phase, you're going to place landscape tiles, which are mountains, forests, meadows, and settlements, and they're going to give you stone and gold, wood, food, and cloth in that order. You have to place them by placing matching tiles on top of, of each other on your own personal map, and, but settlements can cover any tile. Each player has six special tiles that have water on the other side, and they're going to give you special bonuses. You move on to the actions round, where you're going to place workers. There's two types, round and square. The square are your special workers. When people place on an action space, you can place on top of them by paying a resource or a coin to the player that you cover. The actions on the board are things like you take the first player, you draw an island tile, or you place an island tile. There's a thing that helps your cartographer, which is on your board, and that's going to help you place tiles better. Obviously, you get things like money and resources. You get to build one of your income ships, which uh, which all brings you more goods into your into your tableau. The buildings that you can build, you can construct these, are small buildings which are going to add storage, allow you to store more things and give you points. You can draw cards with these, and the large ones are going to give you statue space to build your statues. You can remove obstructions and ruins, or ruins, as they are in the thing, to build those statues. And you can build your supply ships to get you additional actions. You achieve certain things to get those new workers. Now, why are we all doing this? We're doing this to score helm points. And helm points means that you move two ships around the islands, earning bonuses as you go. You score helm points in-game or at the end game with the bonus tiles. I'm sorry about that explanation, people, because I kind of lost the will to live trying to grok this one. There was so much going on, Roman. You're going to be fighting those rules. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt anyone who picks this up needs to be aware that there are exceptions upon individual differences, upon provisos, upon faff, upon extra, upon unnecessary. I, I picked out one just out of, you know, out of the passage bonus. You get a very small bonus for having covered up the three areas that connect your peninsula to the rest of the island for seemingly no good reason and so many things in this rule book i read and went that's for no good reason that's for no good reason that's overly complicated i could carry on sean i'll let you come in before i do a full 10 minute rant yeah well, my my point on that was was caveats there are caveats to caveats in this game so, oh, you had to find a deal. I said exceptions <laughs> and provisos. You said caveats. Oh, all right. So, yeah, but you do. You, this does this. But if you do it, this happens. And if this happens, then this or this happens. You decide. And then whatever you decide, there's the, this or this happens. It's like so much of that going on. I don't know how anybody keeps track of what's going on in this game. And all those actions, it will say to you there's nine action spaces. Really, there's two. They're just two sets that are fair similar but different and this works differently and that works differently and you get one more of those and one less of these and one oh my God. yeah yeah <laughs> there's so many of those buildings so when when i was looking at okay right brilliant that one allows me to take one tile and build two tiles brilliant okay that's simple i think on the next one along allows me to take two tiles but we'll build one tile Oh, the next one allows me to build one of each, but slightly different. <laughs> <laughs> what? So already in the game, all those exceptions and caveats, the rules then change when you're... Oh, every action is different. It goes to the VP scoring. The helm points is just a really complicated VP track where when you get to certain spaces, certain things happen. There's no need for it to be this. It feels like someone sat down and gone... I'm going to turn this into a code. This game is a code, and you've got to be a real gamer. If you don't like this game, you're not a real gamer, because you can't be bothered to work out all the 2,082 moving parts of this that click together. And it's got so much buzz. It's got so much excitement. I think it's number one on the hot list on BGG. And 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you're excited for this. I can't help feeling there's a little bit of gamer snobbery here. And I'm not saying if you like this game or are excited for it, you're a snob. Because there is a subsection that will love all the movement parts of this game. But it's a small subsection. I'm really not excited by this. Because I cannot be bothered to learn the 100 exceptions. And you said it before about some of these games. Someone's going to have to be the games master. This, imagine teaching this. To new people. Imagine all the games mastering you're going to be doing. And oh, watch this, watch that. You've forgotten that. Or oh, that pink cube moves. And, and, and the f- <sighs> so many of the restrictions just seem designed to frustrate. For example, when you build, like you're trying to raise up those layers of cultivation, right? So that you get more cubes as an income because of the layers of cultivation, which in itself is a faffy, fiddly, pain in the bum way of just having cube income. But then when you build, you have to build on your highest level one. So I spent all this time building up my layers for, to then have to then cover them up. Oh. Well, I'll let you go back into rant mode again and you can sum up because um, I don't know what way you're going to go. I'm on tender hooks here. So you really? Yeah. Th- <laughs> there was one bit I actually just didn't understand at all why people would do this. So I get that the the actual placement of the workers is a little bit interesting and a little bit interactive in that if you place above somebody's worker, you have to pay a, a resource to be able to do that. There's a penalty if you can't pay the resource. There's a penalty in that you get an anchor and it stops your ship, one of your ships moving, and then you have to get rid of the anchor, and it's basically a minus point. Why would you place there? And given that there's so many similar action spaces all around the board, why would you place on top of someone if you can't afford it? I just didn't get that. Why? Why would I do that? That upset me. The fact that the worker placement is not actually really worker placement is action selection because you can always select every action anyway. So then that reduces the interaction even more. That's the, the one bit of interaction I saw was you'd have to pay a resource to go on top of someone, but only the last person to go on that stack. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't even get a reward for going there first and thinking, oh, everyone's going to rush this space. Doesn't matter. When one person goes on you, that's your bonus is over. Trap. Trap, 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 trap. Massive trap. It looks like lots of people are going to buy it and all their fingers are going to get snapped off by a huge big Cooper Island trap because too much. It completely, for me, contrasts to Trismegistus, which is simple actions, lots of possibilities. Here, massively complicated actions to very small possibilities. You're all going to end up doing the same thing anyway. Yeah, so if if I went for treasure after saying trap for Trismegistus, so then I'd be found out, wouldn't I? So I'm going to say treasure. No, absolutely not. Too many moving parts, too many caveats. Even the even the pieces, the, the plain pieces are small and fiddly. Yeah, this one's an absolute no-no for me. I just couldn't see myself ever getting to the point where I knew this game enough to actually enjoy myself playing it. So, yeah, absolute trap for me. So moving on, Roland. Steve Paget's buying it in Essen, by the way, and if ever I play it, he is definitely teaching it and running it. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward to that, Steve. We will never, ever beat him at that game. Let's just No, never. 100%. We don't have the brain for it. No. no. I won't care enough. <laughs> Shall we move on now? Move on. Okay, good. This is a completely opposite game. Here we go, beer and pretzels. It's Sanctum, a two to four player game taking 90 minutes. Designed by Philip Neduk, who designed Adrenaline and Goblins Inc. and coming from Czech Games Editions. Through the ages, Zolkin, Codenames, Galaxy Trucker and many more. And before we get too much further into this, Sean, this is looking very doubtful for the show. Ooh, this one was Mm. supposed to be at the UK Games Expo as well. So they're obviously having problems with this one. Yeah, when I looked at the videos from Origins or Gen Con or both... It appeared the end part of the game, which we'll get to explain everyone, wasn't quite worked out, and I'm not convinced they have finally balanced that and worked it all out. And it all triggers on the end game, so I think that's just, you know, me guessing. I think that's where the issues are. So we've got direct from CG that this is doubtful. We might not see this, but we'll talk about it anyway, because it will come out at some point, and we did all the prep before we realised it might not be there. So, you know, you're, you're hearing this one. Shall we go, Sean? Good. Everyone's adventurers. They're adventurers coming out from the city of Sanctum and they're going to go out demon hunting. They're going to be working through seven acts and each act is represented by a mat with a track along it with demons along a path. And at the end of those acts, you're going to be fighting a big boss. 
And it is that big boss that is the whole key to the game because whoever does the most damage to the big boss in the final act is going to be the winner of Sanctum. On your turn, there's a few things you can do. Now, there's no rule book available, so this is going to be a vague thing that I've put together from different videos and, and guides and stuff that we've got. You can be able to move to the next open space on the track ahead of everyone else and claim one of one or two groups of demons there. The demons are on cards. Now, once you've claimed demons, they come in front of you, and on your turn, you can fight them. And the last thing you can do if you don't have demons is you can go back and visit the town via, let's call it a portal scroll, in order to go back and reset and do things. So... If you take a turn and there are demons alive in front of you at the end of your turn, you're going to take damage, which is going to remove some cubes and some possibilities until you heal yourself up. When you fight, what do you do? You're going to roll dice. They can be of two different colours and what weapons you have. You start with a map that has very basic skills, but you can collect weapons along the way. And what weapons you have dictate how many and what colour of dice that you roll. In order to defeat the demons you've previously claimed, they're going to require specific colours and specific numbers of dice. So a particular demon might need a white four and a black three, and that's what you need to do to defeat it. Now, when you roll them, you're then going to be able to spend these gems. Now, you start with some of them, you'll be able to get more via XP, and you can use those and... The different colours of gems that you have correspond to different gear that you can activate on your player mat in front of you on your inventory, and they will mitigate and allow you to change your dice rolls and go up or down to get to the particular numbers you need. If you just manage to get some damage but not all on a demon, then you mark that damage. You don't have to kill it all in one turn, but it will hit you at the end of your turn. If you manage to kill a demon, you actually flip it over. On the front side, as well as showing what damage and what you need to do to kill it, the demon will tell you a type of gear that that demon represents, be it a necklace, a ring, a weapon, a piece of armour, a shield, whatever. When you flip it over, you'll find out exactly what gear it has, and that will come into your backpack, and by visiting the town, you'll be able to put this gear into play on your inventory. Also, it will show you some experience points. When you take experience points, there are two tracks on the side of your character sheet and you take gems off there and they will give you access to power up your equipment and also to different skills that you may have in order to be more effective as you're fighting because it's all about building up becoming more effective like i said when you go back to town you can identify gear you can heal up you can buy potions with gold that you've collected from killing and by selling gear and those potions will either heal on the hoof so you don't have to come back to town and waste a turn in order to carry forging onwards killing more demons collecting more gear getting some sick loot with your elite strats and being the best at defeating the big boss, Sean. Looks good, Ronan. I really like the artwork, and I like some of the design choices. I do like that the monster flips over, and it's a particular item of loot. Agreed, it looks fantastic, and I like the fact that all the monsters appear to be different, and that actually you're making choices of when you go and which demons to collect because if you don't have a necklace and there's a demon with a necklace you might want to go after that one however you're considering what it takes to defeat it if it takes a lot of black dice and you're not set up with your gear that way then you might want to avoid that one because it's going to be constantly nibbling at you until you can defeat it so it does feel like there are choices as you move along the path you're not just blundering into the next set of cards Having said that, there are some choices. It does still seem very quick, very light. You've got the decisions you are making are quite not simplistic, but easy choices. They're not going to make you, as we talked about in the past, furrow that brow too much. This is not a deep dungeon crawler. This is not something that you're going to be considering deeply every move and very strategic. It has got that sort of Euro dice mitigation heart to it, but it does appear to be very light, as you said, and it is very much about very quick turns. And so I do this, you do that, I do this, you do that. They're saying, if you choose to fight a demon, just crack on, just let the next person go because that's got no impact on them. And it's only when you do certain other things that will impact the players in any which way. Once you announce what you're doing, the next players can just carry on going. And CG are very much pushing the flow of this game should be quick, you're having fun, you're drinking a cup of coffee, you're having a beverage and you're just rolling and having Having a laugh, basically, Sean. It, it's clearly based around fast-paced hack-and-slash RPGs. Yeah, so it's the same designer that did Adrenaline for CGE. And although I could see little elements of that with the fast pace and the different weapons and all that kind of thing going on, it's not that tactical game that Adrenaline was. And I think a lot of people were expecting. It is fairly straightforward in that I think a lot of people, as I said, were, trying, were expecting Adrenaline, the fantasy game, and it's not that. Definitely not, and I think they need to make that clear because it comes in a big box, it's got big epic artwork and all the rest of it. I think some people might be expecting a game that this is not. I think a lot of it is going to be important on 
how different those characters feel when it comes to replayability. I, and I don't know what the replayability is, and we've got no details on how the characters play differently, but they all start off slightly differently. Whether that all just disappears as you collect gear or not, I'm not sure. But if you're just starting with the same character every time, running through the same set of demons, how different is each play going to be? Right, okay, so Sanctum for me, Ronan, it's going up against a game that I played recently, which is Unmatched. It's that kind of quick fantasy battle game but i think it sits in that easy to play quick flow of a game but i think it's in that genre and for me i'm going to say that sanctum is a very slight trap i do think i would enjoy games of it but i don't know that i want it in my collection Ronan. my concern is the replayability as to whether i would want it in my collection I don't think we have enough details to clarify whether that's going to be there or not. I'm very interested in it. I certainly want to play it. It's got a lot of appeal to me. And again, I'm real fence-sitting on this one. I'm probably going to drop just slightly to your side of the fence, Sean, and go, trap, it hasn't convinced me of long-term value. Okay. But I think that one could have gone either way if the bosses had it been uh, available to us in the rule book, etc. But yeah, pending more details. Yeah. This is a this is a prelim of a prelim. Fair enough. Okay, so the next game is it's a wonderful world, Roman. Is it? It's a wonderful world. Ish. As long as you're <laughs> in a good mood, I'm in a good mood. Designed by Frederic Gerard and coming from La Boite de Jeu. This is a game about expanding your empire. You're going to choose your path by developing faster and better than your competitors. It is a card drafting and engine building game. The game takes place over four rounds. And in the first round, you're going to draft your development cards. The key thing here is when you're drafting, you reveal each card as you draft it so everybody can see exactly what you are drafting. Then you go on to your planning phase. You're going to either decide to construct the cards that you draft or you're going to discard them for their resources. And you're going to add resources to those constructions to get either production buildings who are going to produce each round or they're going to score for you or do some other slight powers like transmute some of the resources in the game. Then we're going to move on to the production phase. You're going to get your building resources in order and place them on their buildings projects. If you get the most of a type... You're going to get a general or a financier token, and both of them are going to either give you extra points or help you construct. Essentially, Ronan, that is it. You've got this card drafting game where you're choosing your buildings, plays very quickly, very important, the order in which you do things and chaining things off each other. What are your initial thoughts? Everyone's initial thought has got to be, this looks spectacular in terms of the artwork and presentation of it. Yeah, all the components, all the resources sit on a central board, but that's, that central board is actually functional in that it sets the order in which you collect those resources and get the rewards, etc. And the cards themselves, the artwork is, is all very nice artwork, very clear iconography. I think it's, it makes a good initial impression. It certainly does. And those looks translate absolutely zero to the theme <laughs> there's no theme in this game it's, yeah, it's a wonderful world great name looks spectacular we are churning cubes that's it pure euro getting in resources spending the resources for production builders which will give us more resources in fact yeah. you score points by getting resources I think, I think the yeah I think the overall theme makes absolutely zero sense individually the buildings make sense there's buildings that turn one resource to another resource there's building they don't you, make sense I think they do well, to a degree they just churn cubes they just here's your blue yeah. cube it becomes two red cubes eh. yeah <laughs> <laughs> That board, central board you mentioned the fact that you're looking at production of each of the different resources and whoever's top gets a bonus that in itself, providing the competition and the fact that when you get the bonus, it can trigger off to actually boost you up one of the subsequent ones to try and get that bonus, lends to real interest in the drafting because you're really going to care what cards you let go past you. Because if I'm holding the lead in something, I cannot let that, even if I'm, you know, I don't particularly want a card that uses more of that resource, then I definitely don't want to let it go. But equally, hate drafting in this game serves a purpose. Because 
you can draft to deny a player a card and there's still some use of it for you because you just flip it over what's called recycle it and claim the cubes that you get for not building it and that then needs to trigger into something that you need to build and all the rest of it but i like the fact that both there's competition in the draft and that hate drafting comes with something positive comes with something positive and is much easier to grok because you are turning over every time you you draft so you you're drafting a number of cards per round, but it's not like I've got seven cards now and the other person, the other people have got a vague idea what you may have. But you no, know, you're turning it over. Okay, I'm going to a science building. Oh, are you now? Well, I've got science building in my hand. You're not having that too, pal. So yeah, it, it's, it's quite easy to see where you should be sort of holding people back. And it's a different twist on the drafting for me. Not convinced it's easy to see because just because they keep it in their construction area doesn't mean they're going to build it. True. And I yeah, think yeah. There's, there's a bit of reading the other players there mm. of going, uh, I don't know if you're going to build that or not. Or do you want the thing on it to build that other card? And I like that that sort of sense of uncertainty as well. Have you got any other points on it, Sean? Not really, Ronan. I think it it is what it is. It's a very simple and effective engine builder. So Okay, so for me, it's a wonderful world. Trap 100% for the looks, because they're rubbish. There's nothing to do with the game. For the overall treasure, 100%. I love drafting. I like the twist on it. It's quick. You're going to have to read the other players. It gives you something to do even when you feel like you're not doing something. This, to me, feels like cube churning done correctly because it's interactive and I'm just doing my own thing. So definitely, thank you for bringing this one to my attention. It's a wonderful world, 100% treasure. You nearly, you nearly had high squeaky voice there. I, was, I, was, I knew it. I knew I'd get you in there. I'll pull you in there. I knew you were going to get excited. <laughs> I can't believe we don't like this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so simple effective engine builder. I think careful planning is going to see things chaining a lot for you. I think it's going to have enough, enough depth for repeated play simply because of the hate drafting and the sort of visible drafting. I think players are going to adapt as they go along. I think, yeah, we're really, really good at what it does. And I'm in 100%. Watching this video of this with Nat last night while, while I was doing my research, and she was like, ooh, that seems good. Can you get that in Essen? Yes. I'll do it for you, hun. I wasn't going to get it. <laughs> I'm going to do that for you. You're a real hero. I am a hero. <laughs> Don't all wear capes. Don't all wear massive capes. <laughs> right, that is us for the first half of this episode. We will see you in just a few moments for the second. So next up, everybody, is Vilnius, a two to three player, 90 minute game designed by Malta Meinecki, who designed Viroid and coming from Ostrichspiel, who have done Visby and Riga and Tallinn. And those are the capitals of the Baltic states. As you know, Riga, Tallinn and Alvinius, I guess, to finish off the set. Unless they're going to do Moscow next. Who knows? It's not a Baltic state. I'm going to carry on. Vilnius is a co-op deck and tableau builder. And the story is the Teutonic Knights were a set of German knights who went on a crusade against the, the as from their perspective, heathens in the Baltic areas in the 14th century. And you are the people who live in Lithuania looking to fight off the Teutonic Knights and retain your own personality. So at the beginning of each round, each player is going to draw their own cards from various places they can draw from. You're going to have provinces, which are the main thing, the main part of your deck, which drives what you're going to do. You're going to have units you're going to have purchased previously. You're going to be able to store things in a town, which is, uh, you're going to be building up a tableau of buildings with your town and with storehouses. You can put things in there to take up, to power up your next round. And each player is going to draw a Teutonic Knight card. And those Teutonic Knight cards are going to be buildings which will boost Teutonic Knights for the rest of the game, or they're going to be units which will be threatening Vilnius itself. And when those units build up to a certain level, everyone is going to have to fight those knights off. From your hand of cards, you're going to use your province cards to buy these buildings to put into a grid. Now, some of these have got particular requirements as to where you need to place them. Certain sides have to go off certain sides. And you have to be aware that as you build your grid, the buildings that are around the edges are more likely to get damaged when the Teutonic Knights finally attack Vilnius. And the other thing you can purchase with these province cards using the, uh, the goods on them is units for this fighting. As you build up your town, 
It's going to build up your strength. And as I said, these Trajonic Knights cards are there. And at the end of your round, when you finish doing all your actions, you compare the strength of the Knights attacking to the strength of your current town. If the Knights are more, then an attack will take place. These units of Teutonic Knights require certain weapons in order to defeat them, and your units you can purchase have got certain weapons on them. So you're looking to marry up your hand to those units which are building up. If you cannot defeat them all, then the remaining enemies will damage Vilnius, or they'll get rid of your cards. Once that's all happened, if you have got remaining units in your hand, because you might not be able to use them against particular enemies, against defeated enemies, you're going to plunder them, and then you're going to go back and attack. And when you attack, you can either take out Teutonic Knights buildings, which is part of their infrastructure and makes them tougher, or you can attack provinces to recapture them, remembering that province cards are the cards that sort of drive your engine and give you the things in order to purchase to move on and build up. At the end of the game, there's going to be a final attack if you make it, and Vilnius hasn't been damaged. And most of the knights that are left, as long as they're built up to a minimum strength, are then going to attack again. If Vilnius, which has got its own health track, survives and has not taken enough damage, then the players will have won cooperatively. If at any point in the game that Vilnius damage track gets down to zero, all the players have lost, and the Teutonic Knights have conquered Lithuania, as they mostly did in reality. Sean, this is an interesting little game in that only two to three player very euro co-op it's like the stealth fighter of games it's just flown in under the radar because you'd think it would just be a bog standard euro and it's got some different ideas in there yeah well it's it's kind of a blend of euro and tower defense and tower defense seems to be the new in thing at the moment the loads of tower defense games coming coming into the market but this one does it slightly different i'd say leans more on the euro side yeah, it hasn't got the geographical aspect, I'd say, of a real tower defence game. Other than that, I kind of feel your vibe. The vibe I'm not feeling is the looks of the game. They have taken every single shade of beige they can. <laughs> it, is, it is very beige. It looks very Euro. So I think therein lies one of their initial problems in getting this game over. We've talked about it in the past is... Essen's such a big thing. You have to stand out from the crowd. You're not going to stand out from the crowd with this game. And when people do notice it, they're going to assume it's just a bog standard Euro. Where it really isn't. There's some interesting things going. Uh, yeah, and I like some of the idea of the theme in that your infrastructure you're building up hopefully is permanent unless it gets smashed up. But you're also almost building rings of defence around those buildings that you think are vital. The grid building, though, does seem a bit weirdly fiddly like they're dictating to you exactly this card needs to link off this side with this symbol. Mm, that felt unnecessary to me. When, you, when you're building your sort of your own thing, I know you're building it in conjunction with everybody else because it's a cooperative at the end of the day, but you don't want some something dictating to you where things should go if you're building your own tableau up. So, yeah, a little, little bit of a, a negative point there. But what I do like about it, Roman, is that there are so many sort of different troops, different buildings, and different troops are effective against uh, different Teutonic Knights. And I think we can all have a good discussion about who's bringing in what to the fray. Yeah, what was interesting about it, I was thinking, is this going to be one of those co-ops where one of us concentrates on building up buildings, another one concentrates on getting units? There's actually a, a mechanism in there which means that you have to have fairly similar attack values. You can't have someone with, oh, I've got like 12 units and you've got zero, I'll deal with the threat. You actually have to even up a bit. So you are having to discuss with each other, well, I need that particular one because I need a pitchfork here from a farmer. The second thing of that that I, I like, the fact that it feels like you're working together, is that the units are very fleeting. They're in to do a specific purpose, and then they're gone. It's like you're raising levies to do that, you know, defeat this particular attack, and then they're gone again. And I like that sort of feeling of the ebb and flow. If you can see the Teutonic Knights building up, you can see most of what's going to attack you, so you can prepare strategically. I need these particular cards for that particular threat. Obviously, the last one or two, you're going to have less time to prepare for. So it's got a feeling of preparation, but not knowing exactly what you're facing. I think one thing I, w I do want to say about the game, Ronan, is uh, from afar, I do think that this one is going to need such a fine balance to pull off the game. So you're going to have, a balance, have to have a balance in the, in the attacking nights, a balance in what's available to you, how easy it is to get. And what you don't want is it be too easy to fend off the attackers or too hard to fend off the attackers. So that's a problem that all this type of game would, would face. This type of game we call co-ops. <laughs> co-ops <laughs> tower defense whatever you <laughs> okay do you want to sum up on vilnius for us 
Roland, I, I did not have my eyes on this one at all for the reasons we talked. It is very beige. I thought it was just another box standard Euro. Thank you for bringing this one to my attention because I'm really interested in this one. I think that blend of Euro with the tower defence, the, the options available to you, I think I'm in. So I'm going to say this one is a treasure for me. Someone is required to pick me up off the floor. <laughs> I thought you were definitely going to diss this one. This feels strangely thematic to me. Maybe it's because I've read a little bit about the history of it, because I went around the Baltic last year, so I, you know, I was kind of going, oh, a game about that, I've just read about that, always helps. It's like the opposite of Bloomtown, where Bloomtown looks really nice, I'm not sure it's got it all under in the engine. This one doesn't look nice, but I felt like it has got it under the hood. It's definitely a treasure for me. I'm not convinced it's for all. I was surprised Sean was so positive, and I'm happy about that. But I, I'm going to get a you, Sean. This one's coming back with us. We're going to play. Brilliant. I look forward to it. Oh, Fox, which is designed by the wonderfully named Herbie Donkers, coming from Cinnamon Games, playing two to four players. And as it is a family orientate game, it is uh, eight plus is the age range suggested. So this is a movement planning game where one player set is a hunter animal and all others are the prey. So the prey are trying to eat as much as they can in the forest and the hunter is trying to catch them. So in the game itself, you're going to play cards that are going to be directions, stop and eat, pounce, and one by one. And then after eight rounds, you're going to then activate the animals along the pre-programmed route and see what happens. So that pretty much... It, Ronan. The fox and the owls and what have you are trying to swoop down and eat the rabbits and the whatever you use. <laughs> whatever they are, because there could be lots of different monsters and you're not sure exactly who everyone is, right? Because there's, there's options as to who they may or may not be. Oh, this has got to be the hardest category to judge when we're doing these treasure hunts. It's hidden movement games. Because these are super fine edge balance. And even on... A system that works, you can have bad games of a good game. So this was a headache for me, Sean. Just <laughs> not working it out. The rules are very simple. But to try, oh, I'm, oh I just, oh. It seemed like it might be hard for the Predator, specifically on those special moves, because you don't know who's got what special moves. For example, if someone's the rabbit, you wouldn't know that. Meaning they can move from one tunnel space to another tunnel space once in the game. And therefore, you would literally have no idea where they've gone. And there doesn't seem to be a way that you get clues that if you've crossed someone's path, you know you've crossed their path. So why are you kind of sniffing around in the dark a bit? One of the things I wrote down is going to be too hard for the hunter because there's so many other animals potentially running around. It's trying to isolate one, work out exactly where they are. That's the one concern I have, is, is it going to be too hard for the hunter to track them down? And if it is, then it's going to take the edge off the game. There's going to be no excitement because it's going to be too easy for the prey. I'm not sure it will feel easy for the prey, though, because there's only 12 spaces on the board. So, you know, as the hunter moves around, because he just has to cross their path, he just has to walk through them. If, if you're moving two or three spaces on a turn, that's a quarter of the board you're sweeping. Without, But are you doing it blindly? It's just so hard to judge. I like the idea of it and the fact that I think kids will love the tense aspect. I think they'll love being the prey and the hunter because they'll, oh, I think I've got you there. I think I've got you here. And there'll be sort of squeals, you know, from younger kids. Of, and they'll probably give away if we're getting close to them. That would be my hope that I could really Ooh. make them think I was some sort of mind-reading magician. But really, I'm just watching them be obvious. <laughs> but... Will, will kids on the younger side get upset if they jumped? <laughs> but they get to play the whole game, don't they? So it yeah, doesn't get yeah. revealed until... And they don't actually get chomped. They just lose a heart. and So it's, it's not like they're getting eliminated. It's just like, oh, you can just say, oh, the, the fox saw you, so you got scared. That's why you've lost a heart. You know how to manage this, man. You just don't let them get too excited <laughs> about it. So, Ronan, I know it's a tough one, but where, where are you going with this? I don't know. I like the fact that I feel like I could do a lot of bad acting while playing this game. <laughs> and I could pretend to be the, the owl is swooping around the place and get the kids on the edge and all the rest of it. That, I think, would be really funny. I think, in essence, the scoring is going to be pretty random because I just can't see that the Predator's going to have enough information. 
The proof of this pudding is going to have to be in the eating of the yummy prey and the rabbits, the Big Macs of the of nature's world. I have to fall on trap because of that lack of information for the predator. But I'm willing to be proven wrong, and it could be a real crack with some young kids around the table. I think that I can almost guarantee that James, my son, will enjoy this game. So even if it isn't great, I think just, and I said once again, I'm using that word, the theatre of moving around, having pre-programmed, and that, oh, oh, are we going to get, even if I don't get him or he doesn't get me, just the build-up to that is going to excite him and he's going to enjoy the process. The deciding factor has to be the name Herbie Donkers. I've got to respect anyone with that name, so I'm going to say Treasure Roman. <laughs> you had Herbie Donkers watch, didn't you? You had to get a special dip. <laughs> Roots of Marley, Sean, is a two-player, 30-minute game. Adrian Bola and Bujar Haskas, of Dice, who basically designed all these Dice Wars, Dice War Roots of Marley, and Suncore Games is, is their company with which they're doing this. It's a system that's been around since 2015, but I think it's only been a small Kickstarter. There seems to be very few copies floating around, and I think this is on the S and this because it's the first chance for a proper pushed retail release. All those details could be wrong. If they are, let us know by all means. But that's why I've included it anyway. It's the first time Dice War has come to my attention. So I'm going to talk about it. So what's Dice War and what's Roots of Marley? Roots of Marley is basically just one aspect of this system whereby the units themselves are different and each of them have got different powers, which we'll come to. But all the Dice Wars games are two-player combat on a grid in which... Each player has dice which start on a level one and on your turn you can move a die one space. You can attack if the level of your die is higher than an adjacent enemy die or you can upgrade your one of your die one level. When you attack, if you conquer an enemy die, then you score VP equal to the level of it and your first player to get to 10 VP is going to be the winner of the game. Now, in this one, Roots of Marley, it's kind of a plant-themed set of characters. So, for example, all the level ones are fruit, which can't do much, but they can sprout. When they sprout, they spread across. Yeah, from the two bases, they spread out across the board. When you move up to threes, threes can kill sixes. They can also jump over twos and ones. We will kill those twos and ones as they go over them because they're a torchbearer. So they sort of set fire to those plants as they go across. Fours are like tenders of the garden, so they can grow all the ones on the board for you quickly. Fives are shadow walkers. You can go from one edge of the board and loop around all the way to the other edge of the board. And six, obviously, are the highest level ones and can conquer everything. But threes can kill sixes because sixes are like big plants. And threes are torchbearers, so they can set light to them. There's some theme they're trying to go there. Sean, Rue Somali and the Dice War system in general, the artwork they have, the artwork they have for each of these different units, the artwork they have within the rulebook is absolutely amazing. And not one bit of it is on the table when you play. It really isn't, is it? What you get is a grey, beige, hints of green, horrible looking dice. Just horrible. Not... How are they horrible looking dice? They're just bland. How are They're they bland? Boring. That is not straight up. That's not an opinion. That's nonsense. Two dull colours. Black and green. Black and dark green. Dark green is my favourite colour in the whole world. Too bland and colours. They're not grand. They're massive dice. They're top quality according to all the customer reports. Each side of them is etched with a particular symbol that corresponds to the level as well as having shown you what level they are. You are wrong about the dice. Flat out. Oh, I might be wrong about the construction, but the way they look on the table just looks boring and bland. You're wrong about that as well. You're, you're, you can never talk about dice ever again. You're now under a dice ban. The whole thing just looks tedium upon tedium there's no as you said there's no of that beautiful artwork anywhere to be seen what you get is a really striking stunning looking box it stands out from the crowd because it is it's a almost like a present type box with a with a little tiny lid on a, in a, on a big cube and all the artwork with the individual characters on each side of the of the of the cube of the box cube Looking brilliant. You open it up, you get the rule book. Look, oh, look at that oh, wonderful art book. And you take out this beige bland board. It doesn't inspire me on the table at all. I don't know why they haven't implemented some of the artwork onto that table. 
That, I absolutely agree with, and that was my first point. But you're slashing this game to bits. You've got to give me more than this. So, okay, so let's move on. No, no it's not just the looks. It, what, what you have here is a, a no-luck game on a grid that you're either going to be into that type of game or you're not. So things like the Duke, let's go back to chess. The fans of those types of games are going to be the people who are interested in those. While I have a vague affection for chess, I didn't get on with the Duke, and I'd still play the Duke, I think, over this one, because I found the Duke way more interesting in the decisions that you were making. I don't think the decisions in this game are very, very difficult or strong. I think you, you either upgrade or you attack. But then it's what you do with those upgrades. It's then what you decide, once you've upgraded to a certain power, do I maintain this power level? Or do I then change up? Am I looking for a load of torchbearers? Is, is he powering up towards a six? Then I'll, I'll sit on the load of threes. Then his six is useless. He comes near me, I'm going to kill him. With the fives that wrap all the way around the board, then suddenly they appear somewhere completely different. Uh, is that what they're going for? Have they got a load of ones out? They're boosting one up to a four, so suddenly they're going to change all their ones from fruit to sprouts that suddenly double and bifurcate and then start moving on from there. I think there's a lot more choice in here than you think. Just reading into it, I was thinking, oh, there's three or four strategies I'd like to try out playing this game. And which one I'd like to try would depend upon what my opponent's doing with their dice. Okay. So, as we have said, this one did come out a while back. Obviously, Light of Dragons which was the original, and this one have been out for a few years it's, now. So it's four, I think. I think it's been oh, one year four? since 2015, okay. yeah. Okay, so The Light of Dragons is the one that I've, I've seen. There are reviews out from this. I watched a few of them, and even people who like the game itself have said that this one can almost become a stalemate, it can really drag on until somebody makes a mistake, and it's not always that easy to make a mistake. So they question the length. Uh, I read a lot of positive. You know, I usually go to BGG comment section. I read a lot of positive comments. And yeah, there's the odd three here and there that say it was too slow. It, it bogged down for us. But their average ratings for each of them is over seven. Okay. So they're not That's getting an absolute kick in. Okay. I feel like you've come at it definitely from one side. Uh, yeah, definitely. Well, I'm not the target audience for this game. This is not the game that's going to make me, as a person who doesn't particularly enjoy this type of game, go, that is the game that's going to make me cross the divide and, and make me start enjoying that type of game, okay? So I'm not the target audience. I, I come at it from a standpoint. So by all means, if you like this type of game, pay no attention to what I'm going to say. If you are like me and think, oh, actually, I don't particularly like that type of game, then by all means, listen to me if, if you dare. But for me, it's a trap, and it was always going to be a trap. So, And I say that apologetically because it may well be a great game for, for some people. Okay, I feel like these guys, they have created a system, and clearly they're pushing and pushing their full faith this system is somehow going to break out because they haven't designed anything else. They've come out of four sets. This appears to be a bigger, wider release than ever before. And they feel like they've got a hit on their hands that's waiting to happen. It's been waiting for four years at this point. What I think, where well, I would see the best of it if we were to combo up different sets, because I think when you have two that have the same sets of powers, that's where I could see there being a stalemate. To give the system the real chance, I would probably want to buy a couple of different sets and mix and match them which apparently is perfectly viable and then see how they work i think they need to do themselves a favor they've clearly paid for this artwork they got it somewhere put it in the game so that when people see it they say oh that's an attractive game that's caught my eye i'll start playing the system itself i am quite interested in i'm not going mad about it i couldn't no nothing really fired me off but it is a game i'm intrigued to give a go to so i'm gonna say treasure for Roots of Mali and if you do like two player abstract or you like the thought of that idea maybe this is one you could check out it might be a sleeper hit moving on we are going now to paranormal detectives and apologies in advance for the for the names Simon Malinsky Adrian Orzechowski and Marcin Lasinski from Lucky Duck Games playing two to six players 
The theme of the game is a, a ghost is going to guide people to discover the truth about their how their life ended. In the game, one player is going to be the ghost, and all the others are the detectives trying to work out exactly how they died and the circumstances surrounding it. What you're going to do is you are going to play a card. With that card, you can ask any question you like, open-ended, closed question, what have you. But the ghost can only adhere to what the card says. So certain things, it might say, use rope, and the game comes with some string or some wire that you can you can create into a picture. It can say, only use tarot cards that come with the game to explain your answer. Mouth, one word. Guide someone's hand to draw something on a piece of paper, and many, many more. It's a competitive game, should be noticed, that the first person to guess how the ghost died, etc., is going to win the game. Very simple premise. Lots of variety, it seems, Ronan, in, in the cards and the ways that the ghosts can describe how they died. Your first thoughts on paranormal detectives. I'm a bit worried about you. <laughs> Why are you a bit worried, Ronan? I think you may have misunderstood the format of these shows. Go on, sorry. We're supposed to be deciding whether there's a treasure or a trap, whether this game is going to be good or not. Mm -hmm. Why are you bringing out a game that is so clearly a treasure <laughs> that the two of us are going to be so excited about that is such a great idea and has been pulled off so well? What this? There's no intrigue here. Hold on, I get to do what? I've got, I've got to make shapes with a rope to answer a specific question. <laughs> do you know how badly this is going to go and how funny it's going to be? Exactly. It's, it's the chance to be creative and role play and be crap at those things. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine the abuse that's going to get handed out. Like, even when we play Mysterium, right, which clearly this is the closest, even they say it themselves, the closest sort of thing to it, but yeah, it's more yeah. limited than the fact that it's cards. Even when we do that, when we go and revise over about what cards were handed out by the ghost, the abuse is extreme. <laughs> Imagine that. What are you mouthing? No one knows... Why would you mouth a seven-syllable word? No one can... Why are you do It's going to be mental. Uh, it's ridiculous. Why is this even in there? Uh, the one thing I say, the one caveat is, whoever's playing the ghost has to be willing to act up to it. and has to be willing to do the stupid pantomimes. And you have to, you have to know each other well enough that you're happy for the ghost to hold people's hands and draw and all the rest of it. So you, you have to play it in a certain group. Some people are going to be uncomfortable with this game. I understand that entirely. However... I am just super excited to play it. I'm just, I really hadn't looked into it at all. I, I saw the box. I don't know why I can't pass it, but you, you said about it. But once then I started looking into it and I was like, Sean, you're a genius. This is how I believe I missed it. <laughs> Treasure, Sean. I don't have to say that. What? This is. Whole heap of fun in a box, this one. This is the game I wanted Mysterium to be in. I wasn't the biggest fan of Mysterium. It was okay. You're wrong. But I. I know, I know, lots of people like, but this is the game I wanted it to be. I think you've got elements of Mysterium stroke Dixit in there. You've got elements of Dodals creating things. Oh, there's so many games that this brings together, and it just sounds absolutely hilarious. I think you can play for a wide variety of ages, and I think this is a treasure all day long, Roman. That's Paranormal Detectives. Okay, that was an easy one. <laughs> We've got two left for this episode, and the penultimate game is Edge of Darkness from John D. Clare, who designed Mystic Veil, most pertinently, and Space Base and Downfall, and Aldrak, AEG, Istanbul, Love Letter, Thunderstone, lots and lots of games. This is Mystic Veil Made Large, in which you're going to start with a set of cards. Those cards are going to be sleeved. They're going to have one bar of three with some sort of power on them. And then you're going to be able, over the course of the game, to upgrade cards. The story with this one is that it's actually a shared deck that you are upgrading. And when you upgrade cards, you link it to yourself. And as they come through the deck, they will come back to you, even if someone else uses them. So it's not that you're building up your own deck and just using it and churning over as a usual deck builder. Who are we in Edge of Darkness? We represent guilds defending the city of Aegis, Aegis, and there's going to be attacks coming from outside by various monsters. And over the course of the day, we're going to defend those attacks. We're going to build up our infrastructure. We're going to be looking to go out possibly to hunt monsters, and we're going to be looking to score the most VP. On 
a turn. You're going to draft cards up to a hand of three. You have to upgrade one of those cards. And then you're going to be using those cards in order to place agents in ten different locations. Now, there are scenarios within this game. So the locations change all the time. I think for the full version, it's 37 locations. Uh, I don't know what's in the retail version. Anyway, moving forward. Uh, placing agents, defending attacks, and looking to win the most reputation for your guild. There's an even number of threat cubes which go into a bag. And then when players play cards, it develops a certain amount of threat, as in you're attracting the darkness of the city. And you pull out that number of cubes and you throw it into a threat tower. They spread out into three different areas. Once an area's got a certain number of cubes in there, you check and see who's got the most cubes. And it could be the black cubes, the neutral ones. Whoever's got the most cubes in there is going to have to face an attack and if it's the black ones, neutral ones, then everyone is going to have to face that attack. And from there, Sean, I'm really, really confused. I read the rule book twice. I watched a how to play video. I don't really know how to play. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> Yeah, it's there's elements that you kind of know. Okay, so you go into the different areas to get different types of cards and what have you. But as you said before, we started even recording, man. It's, the round structure really isn't clear at all. I think it's because it's all scenario based, and I think it's uh, something that I mentioned before. Tried to mess just. I'd, I'd love to have a look at the cards so that I can actually see how the how the flow of the game is going to work. With this, I didn't get a look at any of the cards. I didn't get a look at any of the locations. So when they're saying you use these cards to do stuff, what stuff? It's all scenario dependent. Ah, I'm going to have to set this up. Now, from being so confused about it, when I went and read the people who have actually got it, because it's been delivered from Kickstarter, this is its retail release, they said this is really simple to play. And it re as soon as you get it out and you get the scenario out, the cards explain exactly what they do. The areas explain what they do. So when it's on the table, it's a smooth playing experience, according to reviews I've read. Trying to learn it for this was a very confusing experience. So, you know, you're going to have to balance our thoughts on that. One of the things I could definitely tell was, though, Sean, it looks incredible. It's got fantastic production values. It does a lot of beautiful artwork on there. Obviously, the production values coming from that Mystic Veil card sleeving and also run a massive, massive table presence. You're going to need a, a quite quite a bit of space to play this one. Yeah, there's even boards that they say are optional, saying that you might not have space for these boards, so you can just <laughs> set it up this way. If you've got space, use these two boards to help out. It's, it's a much bigger, more epic version of Mystic Veil, vale. One of the things that I think that seems to add to all that is that there's replayability in that box. In the different scenarios, they do play differently. You have got to think differently. You are doing certain slightly different things. That is obviously a huge positive, Sean. We've, you've got a lot of the building blocks for a hit here in production, in replayability, in apparent ease of play. It's just I'm finding it hard to tie it all together. It is, and the replayability goes onwards, I think, with that cube tower. Now, I'm not sure if you're a big fan of the cube tower system, but I think what it does do is it is keeps it you on your toes. It, uh, not necessarily theatre. <laughs> it, 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 it keeps you on your toes, doesn't it? You never know quite what's coming next. You can never predict what's coming next, and it's going to come at you in sort of different waves and different strengths and different things to think about so I, I really like the thought of that it does seem funny that you've all got even cubes in there though so and this is part of the people have said that they really does do the guild theme better than other games that they've played because you're just trying to influence a city and if i'm taking lots of risks you're as much at risk as i am and it, that kind of feels like, yeah, well, we're all in the same city. The city's under threat. Why are you risking this so much? You're, but can you be a bit of a, on that? Oh, this isn't going so well for me. I'm just going to take loads of risks and help some, hope someone else gets attacked. Well, yeah, that, that's obviously one of the great levels in the game, Ronan, is that, yeah, as you said, that you're all facing the same same issues. So why not pass the love around, eh? We're going to call it love. That's, that's <laughs> This is a question for you, Ronan. You weren't a massive fan of Mystic Vale. I think you ended up trading it onwards. Does that system work for you? How does how does that system feel to you? No, I, I did like the system. I just thought Mystic Vale was too basic and that I was doing nothing with it. 
you know, it, it kind of gave me a um, century feel to it, where you've just taken a basic system and just not done anything with it. You're just... This was designed first, Edge of Darkness, and the Mystic Veil was released to give people an idea of what the card building idea was all about. And I understand that. But Mystic Veil felt like a tutorial. This seems like it's the full game. Okay, to sum up, Ronan, I I, I like the, the backstory of the City of Aegis. Artwork looks amazing. I'm interested, because I never played Mystic Veil, I'm really interested to play the card sleeve system. And I love me a, a, a cube tower. So, I mean, I'm going to say that Edge of Darkness is a treasure. I am also in. I like that they named the city after us, the city of Egypt. Despite the barrier Didn't. there, that, <laughs> despite the barrier that I can't quite see how it all meshes together now, I believe from that once you get into it and see it all, that it will all flow. There's lots of positive reviews. It's got a very high average rating so far on BGG. I like the idea, like I say, of, of Mystic Vales. I wanted more. This has given me more. I'm very excited for Edge of Darkness. So this one is definitely a treasure, Sean. Hey everyone, Ronan here. So we did promise you a 12th game just there. Slight issue. We had a technical issue uh, with the feed of Sean's end and it didn't record. The 12th game was going to be Cine Tempore. At the end of the day, it's a sci-fi co-op miniatures game with a progression tree and a unfolding narrative it was kick-started and there were lots of issues around the game including the rule book we thought that the system looked really promising with a, a time track that worked very cleverly uh, and like i say with this exploding narrative and with aliens that react to what you do but that this particular version of the game hasn't come out quite smoothly enough they're actually doing a re-implementation with it called Divide et Impera. So we're both going to give two traps to Sine Tempore, but discuss Divide et Impera and the fact that it's coming, I believe, to Kickstarter in 2020. And we're going to have a look again and see what refinements they do to the system, whether the rulebook has been cleaned up, because we think at heart there's a good game there. That pretty much summarises it for you. So we weren't sure whether to go back in and re-record it at a different time to say that was good enough. It's not one that we'd recommend you pick up in Essen at this time, but keep an eye out on what happens next. Lovely. Well, there we go, Sean. That's 12 more games treasure hunted. We hope that this is whetted your appetite for more. Hope you're enjoying our prep for Essen. We have got one more treasure hunt to come before the show. We might possibly squeeze in Oh, there may be other episodes before the show, but it's, it's all getting quite tight. But I'm getting incredibly excited now, Sean. Oh, very much so, Ronan. Starting starting to plan my hall my hall visits and what hall first and go there first, and then if I if I go in this order, yeah, it's all, it's all coming together now. I'm getting very excited. Something else we should mention: we are about hopefully to record with Dan Hughes and Mike Delisio on Sporadically Bored. So if you listen to that show, then you might catch us in the near future. And if you don't, go and listen to it. It's great. Uh, although they don't really talk about board games, just random nonsense, bless them. Occasional board game talks. Something very occasionally board game talks. We're going to be talking about, is it how you, what games you decide to buy or how you prepare to buy games? or how Yeah, how you, how you decide what games are for you. That's so basically what we do <laughs> in these treasure hunts. Yeah, we stand so really like peek behind the curtain on how these are done. There you go. So thank you very much, Ronan. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. We will catch you next time. Indeed, and we are very proud members of the Dice Tower Network. Go there and to the Dice Tower itself for gaming goodness galore. If you wish to download the episodes, we are on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, and Stitcher. If you wish to catch us on social media, go to our Instagram page, our Facebook page, but we are most active on our Twitter at Game Pit Podcast. If you wish to contact us, then you can email us on thegamepitpodcast at gmail.com or pop along to Board Game Geek to our guild where we'll happily respond to you. Don't forget that we do have our YouTube channel, which is full of pit spit videos, which are overviews on games and occasional convention coverage. Thank you so much for listening to the episode, and we'll catch you next time. Music by E. Aaron.
Boo.